I was walking along a path with two friends. The sun was setting. Suddenly, the sky turned blood red. I paused, feeling exhausted, and leaned on the fence. There was blood and tongues of fire above the blue-black fjord in the city. My friends walked on, and I stood there trembling with anxiety, and I sensed an infinite scream passing through nature. In describing the sensation that inspired his iconic masterpiece, The Scream, in 1892, Edward Munch might well have been talking about his own tragic life. Not only was his childhood marked by the death of his mother and his favorite sister from tuberculosis, but Edward was often sickly himself. His father, Christian Munch, raised his surviving children in an extremely religious environment, including telling his children that their mother was looking down from heaven at them whenever they misbehaved. There was also a history of mental illness in the family. One of his younger sisters was diagnosed with mental illness and spent much of her life in an asylum. Edward would eventually comment that, I inherited two of mankind's most frightful enemies, the heritage of consumption and insanity. Starting from adolescence, Edward's art came to dominate his life. He disappointed his father by becoming a painter, which his father considered to be an unholy trade. Over the next several decades, Edward Munch's artistic talents were increasingly recognized. Unfortunately, the troubles in his life increased as well. The death of his father left his siblings destitute, and Edward went into debt to support them all, including his sister in the asylum. As he grew more prominent in art, he became more self-destructive as well. In addition to his chronic alcoholism and tobacco use, he also began taking a bizarre cocktail of nerve and pain medications to keep himself going. His health was never good, so his drinking and hard living sent him into a downward spiral. Munch's relationship with his mistress, Tula Larson, ended after an accidental shooting that permanently damaged two of his fingers. He was frequently given to public brawls and drunken binges that alarmed his friends and family. Although he was getting frequent commissions and public honors, Munch hit rock bottom by 1907. Actively delusional, he initially checked into a clinic in Copenhagen but fled during the admission interview. Due to Munch's worsening condition and failure to seek help on his own, his friend, Emanuel Goldstein, forced him into the private clinic of Dr. Daniel Jacobson in Copenhagen. Although his medical reputation wasn't the best, Dr. Jacobson ran a successful clinic that catered to well-to-do patients. On admission, Jacobson diagnosed Munch as suffering from dementia paralytica, linked to his alcoholism. Nowadays, he'd probably be diagnosed as either delirium tremens or Wernick's encephalopathy. As it was, he was lucky not to get a diagnosis such as general paresis or neurosyphilis, which might have led to him being locked up for life, which was why Munch had been afraid to seek help in the first place. In many respects, the rest cure that Jacobson prescribed for Munch was, if you'll pardon the expression, just what the doctor ordered. On admission, Jacobson had Munch placed in a locked room for eight days until his hallucinations and other symptoms came under control. Jacobson took Munch off the cocktail of drugs and alcohol that he had been taking for years and gave him no other medication except for sleeping drops, probably chloral hydrate. During his stay at the clinic, Munch was given ample bed rest, good food, fresh air, and regular sun baths that helped him immensely. Some of the other treatments that Jacobson prescribed were a little more bizarre, however. In addition to electrification, which basically amounted to running mild electrical currents through the patient's body using a special generator, the Jacobson Clinic also specialized in special treatment baths. These baths involved diluted carbonic acid, with extra ingredients including, among other things, iron fillings, salt, soda, potash, sulfur, fur needles, oak bark, malt, and bran. For patients suffering from hallucinations, the baths could also include milk or bouillon, and even blood from freshly slaughtered animals, and I'll bet you thought that bloodbath was a figure of speech. Munch was fortunately spared the blood baths, but otherwise had the full course of treatment that Jacobson's clinic had to offer. Munch actually enjoyed the electrification sessions, at one point, he drew a cartoon of himself wired up to the electrical apparatus with the caption, Professor Jacobson passing electricity through the famous painter Edward Munch, changing his crazy brain with the positive power of masculinity and the negative power of femininity. 
While he was fond of the female staff, with whom he often flirted, his relationship with Jacobson was always lukewarm. When Jacobson suggested that Munch paint his portrait, Munch complied by representing him in the painting as a somewhat domineering figure, though Jacobson actually didn't like it that much, although the portrait is now considered one of Munch's best. Along with other paintings, Munch also completed a journal of his stay at Jacobson's clinic, which was later published as The Mad Poet's Diary. While Munch had initially planned to stay only eight months, he didn't actually leave the clinic until 1909. It was an expensive stay for him, no socialized medicine back then, and he needed to borrow money to cover the costs, as well as continue caring for his surviving family members. Still, when he finally left the clinic, Edward Munch made quite a spectacle of it. He dressed up in formal wear and made his elaborate goodbyes to the other patients, stating that Pierre Gent bids farewell to his fellow lunatics. Daniel Jacobson offered to accompany him to Oslo and capitalize on some of the publicity over his star patient, but Munch refused. After leaving, Munch never returned to the clinic and rarely referred to it in later years. When Jacobson later sent him a number of sketches that Munch had drawn at the clinic and asked him to autograph them, which would have raised their value considerably, Munch kept the drawings instead. Edward Munch spent the last two decades of his life in relative solitude at his estate in Oslo. He followed enough of Daniel Jacobson's lifestyle recommendations to avoid a repetition of that terrible breakdown of 1907, including avoiding tobacco, alcohol, and poisonous women. Despite a bout of Spanish flu in 1918, he remained relatively healthy throughout his old age, but was overshadowed by the Nazi occupation of Norway in 1940. Ironically, while the Nazis denounce his art as degenerate, many of his paintings were confiscated and some of his great works, including The Scream, had to be kept hidden. When Munch died in 1944, he received a state funeral, organized by the Nazis, which gave him an unfair reputation as a collaborator. Today, many of Edvard Munch's paintings still invoke themes of life, love, angst, death, and depression. He probably wouldn't have had it any other way. <laughs>